So we're in a new series today, and we're in a new series today. And uh, forgive me, I don't want to. I don't want to be. I don't want to. If I'm talking too quietly, somebody say speak up, and if I'm too loud, then they'll shut me down in the back there. But um, I am myself short of breath, so you have to help me. Just, just, just listen <laughs> as closely as you can, and keep me in prayer. Um, I, I don't feel terrible, by the way. I just am short of breath. I just don't feel great. And so I need you to pray for me, too, because my energy level is not what it's supposed to be. I am getting tested again. My tests came up negative, but uh, nobody in our house is feeling stupendous right now except Julian. <laughs> he feels great. He has all the energy in the world, uh, which is fantastic. So today we're going to start on a new series, and the new series is from, is from Dream to Destiny. Now, I've taught on this before. I don't remember if I taught on it here or at a different church. I can't quite recall. But, it, but I've taught on Dream to Destiny before, and it's a whole series. And it's about God giving us hope and God giving us a future <clears throat> and God giving us direction. And uh, it's, it's based on the life of Joseph and based on some of what Joseph went through and where he was and where God brought him. And you say, Pastor, with everything that we're facing... Is this really the right time for this, for this series, the life of Joseph, where we're at now? Yes, it is. Here's why this is pertinent. It's pertinent because we don't know what the future brings. Neither did Joseph. It's pertinent because Joseph started with, with, with something, and, and he, he had to live a life. And if you're familiar with the story, I hope that you are, and we'll go through it here in Genesis in a minute. But, uh, he, he went through some things that made him into what God had prepared him to be so that he could be ready for what was coming. Now here we are, because this is what, that should have rung a bell with you right now. That should have rung a bell just now. God is preparing us for what is coming, because I got to tell you, I think what is coming is going to be harder than what we have faced. Let me be clear. I don't know, I'm not saying that God isn't able to allow the church to win political victories and to win evangelical victories. I'm not saying that God is not able to do that. I think that he wants to. But I also think that we are under a time of testing. We are under a time of duress, the church and individuals, on purpose because everything tested by fire is purer. We will get to the purity test, not today, because that's a whole different sermon, but we're getting to it. But today, we're going to start with the life of Joseph and what he had to go through so that God could show him, you have to do this, you got to experience this junk so that you can be what you need to be when the time comes. And it might smart a little. <laughs> what do you mean? And that's not even a common term anymore. Like, like that's an old term. Like, when you say, ooh, that's smart. Do you know what that means? Do you know what that means? Shh. Do you know what that means? Yeah. <laughs> that's smarted. You don't know what that means? To you? Doesn't I tell you something? <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> that's what I tell you. <laughs> when something smarts, it hurts. <laughs> I love you, man. <laughs> thank you. By the way, thank you for pointing out my illustration. I know you knew. It just needed a second. To, like, oh, that's right. I remember. <laughs> Listen, when something smarts, it hurts. And that's what has to happen to the church and to us and to Joseph for us to be where we're supposed to be. Let me move on. So here we go. We're going to read it. The, what we're in right now, this is the first one. <clears throat> Because the series we're going through is going to be a series of tests that Joseph goes through. A series of tests that Joseph has to go through. And the first one is the pride test. The pride test. Let me read it. Genesis chapter 37 verses 1 to 11. Now as we go through this series, you're going to hear verses repeated. But we're going to start with this right here. Genesis chapter 37, verse 1 to 11. And before you say, pride, oh, pastor, that's not my problem. That's not my issue. I got a lot of issues already. I got a lot of problems. Pride is not one of them. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's everybody's problem. Because everybody wants to look a certain way. 
Nobody wants to be mistaken or, 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 or seen as something they don't want to be seen as. So pride can be in, in the person that earns the lowest income and lives, maybe they're homeless and lives on a street. You know, pride can still be an issue. I lived in North Jersey for a long time, worked in the city, as you know, I think. New York City, I worked in all five boroughs, Queens, Brooklyn, Manhattan, all of it. And I did human resource training for OSHA. I worked all those things. And there were many times where there were homeless people and you'd go to give them something and their pride, literally, their pride would rise up. No, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. No, you're not good, you're hungry. I can see that you have nothing, but pride goes from somebody who has zilch to somebody who's a multimillionaire. Pride is not exclusive to somebody with a lot. Pride is a condition of the human ego. So here we go. Genesis 37, 1 to 11. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed. Jacob. The land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man, 17, tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah, and the sons of Zilpah, two different wives, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Stop. Joseph, mind your own business. Whatever. Let's move on. Verse 3. Now Israel, I don't know why it's in there, but it's in there. Joseph, what are you talking about? Shut up. It's not your business to tell your dad what your brothers are doing. <laughs> Whatever, it's okay. Moving on. Verse 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons. Jacob. Love, th because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. And he said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose. And if you've ever seen a sheaf of grain, it's just grain. They're tied together, right? They're bundled. And okay. And the field. Suddenly a sheaf rose up. Mine stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed to it. Stop. Pause. Hey, moron, why are you saying this? You're going to tick them off even more. They already know you. Don't, you already know they don't like you. Let's move on. He's seven. Remember, he's 17. His brother said to him, do you intend to reign over us? Will you actually rule us? And they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said. And rightly so. And rightly so. I'm, paraf and I'm adding that. Then he had another dream and he told it to his brothers because he didn't get it the first time. And this time, <clears throat> listen, he said, I had another dream. And this time the sun and moon and 11 stars were bowing down to me. Remember, his father loves him. When he told his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, What is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to you? Bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. His father loves him, but he's also thinking, Dude, shut up. That's what he's thinking. What are you doing? But he kept it in mind. Joseph was born to do great things. I told you, he's going he's gonna to have to pass a whole bunch of tests to get to where he needs to be. He was destined to do great things, have great power. When he received this, remember, he's 17, but the word indicates that he was 30-something before he ever steps into his power. Now, that's later. But he's 30-something before he ever comes into the power because of all the things he's got to go through to get there. So here's my question for you. You might be 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, plus. <laughs> I'll stop there. Thinking, well, I, aren't, I, aren't, aren't I done? No. Never, not ever. You're never done. What is God 
God called you to do in this moment, in this season? What has he called you to do? What have you done to get there? Have you encountered anything that got in your way? Obstacles? Be honest. Can I, can I just ask a quick honest question? Do any of you in here feel like, I feel like maybe God had called me to do something? And be honest, this is a very candid moment. But it's not, I mean, everybody's in the same boat. Has that, does anybody in this room feel like God called me to do something, but I kind of feel like maybe, and maybe I'll still get there, but maybe I kind of missed the boat a little bit. And I didn't do, okay, there's several, okay, okay, okay. Listen, every one of us has a destiny in Christ. Every one of us. I was talking to David Hearn earlier. And he made this comment to me as I found it funny. I found it very interesting that he said it. It's like, God has a plan. And I'm like, yes, he does. That's the sermon. God has a plan. A destiny for every person in this room. And it's never too late. Because you can't mess God up. There are rocket scientists rocket scientists who can pull out a diagram of something and then blow it up, a blown up diagram. And they can show you, they can show you all of the intricacies of where their work takes them. And there, there's, there's formulas and there's logistics and there's things I can't even understand in English. But they know where they're going. And it's complicated. And do you understand that when God looks at something like that, he goes, Boo. child's play. Your logarithms are a joke. It's like a two-year-old. Why? Because God's plan for the entire cosmos is already set. Do you understand? Compli like, this will hurt your head. It'll hurt your head if you think about it too long. He's too much greater than we are, Isaiah, right? His thoughts are above my thoughts. I can't understand God or what he knows or what he does. But I can't go far enough that he'll mess up and, get, get, and stumble over what I did. That he can't say, okay, we'll just redirect your path so that you fulfill the plan that I have for you. He still does that. I hope you understand that. Every one of us has a plan. How do we get there? What happens on the way? Can I tell you something? Please don't think. Please don't think, well, now I'm just depressed. Because I'm here at point A, and I wanted to be a point B. And I can't be happy in the Lord until I get to point B and know what I'm supposed to be doing. I can't be happy till I get there. No, that's not true. We have peace and joy and contentment on the drive to get there. Now, if you're anything like me, driving anywhere with my family is like hell here on earth. It is, I'm sorry, too much. It is the worst thing in the, I would rather have a root canal without anesthesia than drive two hours with my children in the car and my wife. If either one of the children is missing from the drive, it gets a little better. If my spouse is missing from the drive, it gets a little better. But when all three of them are in the car, it is the worst torment in history. And I don't want to go. I don't care if we're going to Disney World. No, I don't want to go. I'll sit over here and you three sit over there. For some reason, it is very, very difficult. It, it just is. So here's what I've learned. <laughs> Sorry. Is it just me? Oh, thank you. All right. So here's what I've learned. I've learned that I used to think... By the way, if Andrea, if you're watching this online, forgive me. <laughs> I've learned in life when I was younger, 
I'm not going to be happy. I'm not going to be content. I'm not going to be at peace till I get to where I need to go. Where did I think I needed to go to be preaching as a pastor? Great, you're here. You must be so happy. I am happy. Don't get me wrong. But I realized it wasn't the point to wait till I got to point B to be happy. It was to be at peace with the Lord on the trip and trust him and know that the plan has not failed. So don't give up. The natural step when we think I have not fulfilled my dream, I did not do what I thought I was supposed to do. This is Joseph. Can I just, let's go back to Joseph. Joseph is 17. He tells them this dream. This is awesome. I'm the man. <clears throat> they don't take it right. They do not take it right. So now he wants to get where he's going, but he realizes he's not there yet. And it's going to be very difficult. And maybe you're there. I didn't get to where I need to be. And the natural step is to compare yourself to someone else. That's the natural next step. The natural step is to say, how come they're doing fine? How come he's doing better? How come she's doing better? And that's a slippery slope. A, you don't know where they're at. B, your life is not anybody else's life. Your plan is not God's plan that, somebody, that he had for somebody else. Your plan is the plan he had for you to get you where you need to be. Okay. You will face tests along the way. I have about 10 of them. Not for today, just one. Today, just one. Maybe you haven't faced them yet. Maybe you faced them and failed them, as we talked about a second ago. Maybe you passed a few of them. But rest assured, if there's some things that you've faced and failed, God will bring them back to you. You'll face them again. Because he won't let you move on until you face the things that he brings to you to overcome, to surpass. I want to encourage you this morning. And I'm not trying to depress you. I'm trying to encourage you. And matter of fact, let God encourage you. Let God encourage you. He does not give up on you. He doesn't let go. His dream for you, his plan for you is bigger than yours is in your own head. His plan for you, your fruitfulness, your effectiveness, the things you're going to say to someone are more important to God than they are to you. You don't even realize what God has for you to do that he's going to take and he's going to he's going to influence. And by his Holy Spirit, he's not going to water and make it more fruitful than you thought. And you just thought you were doing something good at the moment. You cannot dream a bigger dream than God has for your life. I don't care if you're 90. I don't care if you're 10. God has a bigger dream for you than you do. Because there's a plan. You say, Pastor, have you looked around? You seen the news? You seen what's going on? Yeah, and that's why he's preparing the church. That's why he's preparing us. Because the time is coming, as I said before. I think, I, I, I believe this. It's going to get harder before it gets easier. And that's okay. It's not meant to scare you. It's meant to say, press in. Be faithful. Because not only is it going to get harder, but it's going to get more satisfying. What? I'm saying this. Yes, it might be harder. Yes, it might look bleak. Yes, things might look like, oh, woe is me. Woe is the church. Woe is everything. Everything is falling apart in a handbasket. No. The victory will be that much sweeter when you see God move in your midst. Let me move on. We're talking about pride today, so I got to move on. Each of us are super, you need to know this. Each of you are supernaturally entwined with each other, whether you know it or not. You are, we are literally supernaturally entwined with each other. Remember that, remember that illustration I gave of the, of, of the logarithms and the diagrams that, that a rocket scientist might use. Well, if it, everything, everything fits together and you are supernaturally intertwined with everyone else in God's schema, for lack of a better word. 
His diagram, his picture, his schematic is way more complicated than mine. And you are intertwined with everybody else, whether you know it or not. He created you to accomplish some very specific things that only you will accomplish. Only you. Let's don't dwell on failures and past hurts because we, do, we all have that. And we've all done our best to botch up the plan. It's what we do. It's what we do. We're human. But I believe we will still see an outpouring of souls because that's what the word of God tells us. In the last days, people will cry out to God. They will. All souls. All, all, all manner of people from all countries and all different will cry out to God before the, I believe this, before the rapture happens, I believe there will be an outpouring. I want to be a part of that. Don't you? I don't want to be wrapped up in my, my retirement plan. I don't want to be beholden to you know, investments and this and I, I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of God's plan. To be blunt, we're not supposed to sit around waiting for the rapture. It's coming, but that's, to be blunt, we're not supposed to be sitting around waiting for it. We're supposed to be busy. And many of you are, and I applaud that. Again, I believe we need to get busy, but to do what we have to do that, we have to prepare and we have to recognize the tests that we're going to go through to get there. And this is the pride test. I'm going to read the text again, the whole thing through without stopping. I'm going to read the text again because I think it's important. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, tending the sheep with his brothers, the sons of Bila and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he'd been born to him in his old age. He made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him, could not speak a kind word. Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers they hated him all the more and he said to them listen to this dream I had we were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose and stood upright while your sheaves gathered around mine and bowed his brother said to him do you intend to reign over us will you actually rule us and they hated him all the more because of his dream and what he had said don't jump ahead. You know the story. Don't jump ahead. Just listen to this. Then he had another dream, and he told this to his brothers. Listen, he said, I had another dream, and this time the sun and moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. When he told his father, when he told his father, when he told him, <clears throat> his father, as well as his brothers, his father rebuked him and said, what is this dream you had? Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow down to the ground before you? His brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the matter in mind. A well-known evangelist slash author, very well-known, who I won't mention right now, shares a story of when he got saved at around 18, 19 years old. And he met an even better known evangelist, a famous evangelist. I guess you could call him successful. And the guy asked him to travel around with him. The older evangelist asked this young man, travel around with me and preach and, 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 and teach to the schools that we go to. He even titled him an associate evangelist. Pretty flattering stuff. At 19 years old, that's pretty flattering. So the young man goes on to say in his book, how people would compliment and tell him how he was prophesied over and there was anointing in his life. And here's the thing. The danger in this guy's life was that he began to believe the hype. He began to believe the hype, and there's where the pride set in. I'm a man of God, he's thinking to himself. I'm a man of God, and you might be thinking, I'm a man of God, I'm a woman of God. I'm good, I'm successful. I be he began to realize pride was setting in, so he begins to pray, he sees it. So he says, God, get this out of my heart, I don't want it. And in a number of months, the Lord led him out of ministry and into a job at a motel as a security guard. Nothing wrong with that job. Nothing wrong with being a security guard, but it wasn't his calling. Several months later, he calls the ministry again to see if he could get involved. And they allow him to cover the prayer hotline on the graveyard shift. That's the middle of the night. <clears throat> While he was there, he meets this guy who happens to be the son-in-law of the older famous evangelist who'd hired him to begin with. He's the son-in-law. 
right? So he's on the phone, this young man, with somebody on the prayer line, on the prayer line, some, a woman seeking prayer. She says, your voice sounds familiar. Without thinking, he says to her, ah, well, I'm an associate evangelist, and I travel speaking and preaching. And when he got off the phone, the son-in-law said, why did you tell her that? And he responded, because I used to be an evangelist, and don't you think it would bless her to know who's ministering to her? And the son-in-law said, before he said this, the young man says to the this, to this son-in-law, don't you ever tell anyone you're his son-in-law? And he responded, no, I, I don't. Because if they are blessed by who I am, they've missed the point. You see, it's not about who we are. It's not. It's not about who we are. Or what we've done. Or what we think of ourselves. It's about who we point to when we're ministering. That's pride. That's pride. It is at Jesus' privilege for us to honor and serve him. Not for us to point out how good we are. At work, at school, at family reunions, wherever. We ought to be talking about Jesus. I, a number of years ago, a number of years ago I had an opportunity, me personally, I had an opportunity to be hired to replace somebody at a very, very large church to do youth and to do worship. But it was, it was replacing someone and I didn't feel right about it. And so I spoke to this someone who I'd be replacing and I said, do you not want to do this? And he looked at me and he said, no, I do want to do this. And I, I really, with all my heart, I want to do this. And, and it, boy, it was, I'm telling you, it was an opportunity. It was a huge church with a lot of opportunity for growth, for expansion, for everything. And something within me said, don't do it. You need more time. You're not ready. And you know what? I wasn't. I wasn't ready. I needed years of God to humble me more. This is me. This isn't a story. I needed years for God to humble me more and bring me somewhere else where I botched that up and then I moved over there and I and I struggled in this thing and I struggled in that thing. I needed years for God to get me where I needed to be. So the story of Joseph, when I look at it, I think, yeah, oh, I get this. I get this. You're always going to deal with the test of pride wherever it's at. The higher you the higher up you see ourselves, the more dangerous it is. The more the more confident we are in who we are, the more dangerous it is. Be careful that you say, I stand, lest you fall. The word of God says, be careful you say, I stand, lest I fall. As Christians, we can think, we can sit back, begin to think, I got this. I got this. Doing this a long time. Then the test comes and we flunk. Then the test comes and we flunk and we fail. And get our feelings hurt. And when we get our feelings hurt, any matter of things can happen. We start hurting other people. We take our ball and go home. Well, I'm going to go over here to this ministry over here or this church over there where they appreciate me. Or maybe it's not that, but it's just a certain person. Well, I'm not talking to them again because they're, they're clearly not spiritually mature enough to understand me. Never understanding it would take a little bit of humility on our part to do the right thing. This is hard stuff. This is pride stuff. Look at my life. Look at my kids. Look how good we've done. Look how well we've done. Oh, it's not, you know, <clears throat> God knows exactly what to do to keep us humble. God knows exactly what to do to keep us humble. If I had any, if I had any thoughts on being prideful, he gave me two children. That was the end of that. That was the end of that. And then he gave me a dog <laughs> who's adorable. She poops in the kitchen. Not anymore. I think she's pretty well trained. She's a sweet little thing. But I mean, there's no, there's no pride there. <laughs> how prideful can you be with, oh, darn it, she pooped again. Here we go. <laughs> like, how, what kind of arrogance is that? Like, if I had her here and I had to, and she pooped on the stage, what would I do? I'd wipe it up. There's no pride there. Like, literally, like, how, what right do any of us have to be prideful about it? Anything we've done, <coughs> including our kids, including our kids. Look at how well my daughter is doing. 
We did this pretty well, honey. That's arrogance. Be careful that you say I stand, lest you fall. It's okay to be proud of your kids, but be proud in Christ. Thank God he never flunks us. <laughs> he doesn't. Even when we fail the test, he doesn't flunk us. He just says, redo. Do you ever have a, anybody in here golf? Do you ever hear of a mulligan? <laughs> like, I don't golf, but they, my, thank God, thank God he's merciful. And he says, I'm not going to fail you. I'm going to retest you over and over and over till you get it right. I don't know how good a student you were. I was a terrible student. And here's what happened. All year long, I failed every class. All year long. And then at the end, for the finals, I'm like, oh, I better pay attention. And I'd ace everything. And my teachers hated my guts. Because <laughs> they were like, you could have done this from the beginning. I'm like, yeah, but that's no fun. I was a, <laughs> I was a horrible student. I was. <laughs> my mother will attest to this. It's not that I couldn't do it. It's that I didn't want to do it. Terrible. I hope Julian is not listening. He might be in the room. He's in the building somewhere. But I thank God that God never put an F on my paper. He just said, redo. Redo. Back to Joseph. He's feeding sheep. He's faced with these flattering dreams from the Lord. What would you do? He's feeling great. Joseph is feeling like, hey, I'm the man. He's 17. Whenever I hear someone say, listen, please, be, uh, don't, don't be hurt or offended by this. Whenever I hear somebody say, I did this for the Lord, quote unquote, I did this and I did that and God gave me this opportunity and God has allowed me to do that and, and here's how much I pray and here's, you know what it does? It sends up red flags. It makes me very nervous for that person. Because the moment you take glory from God, he will humble you. Nothing I do is done without grace and mercy. And God looking at this peasant thinking, I like using foolish things to confound the wise. Nothing is further from the truth that I've seen than people who build themselves up. Nothing is further from the truth than for me to watch God bring them back down. That's a scary place to be in whatever area. But, but pastor, I'm not in ministry. Oh, it's not just about ministry. It's about serving him. It's just about honoring him. Let me move on. The point is we don't prop ourselves up. We point to Christ, always, period. We serve and succeed. We serve and succeed, and we fail all at God's pleasure. Does that make sense? Do you understand? Joseph knows where he's going. He's had the dreams, but he has to learn the lessons, has to get there. Joseph eventually gets this over the years of trial. He faces all this stuff and he realizes his dependence on the Lord and how God uses him to glorify himself. And God knew just where God knew just where to tinker in Joseph's life to get him where he needed to be. He did. There's a there's a, a story. You might have heard this before. You know, Henry Ford, you know, the the. The car manufacturer, they started the Ford Motor Company, designed the Model T and assembly line and the whole thing, and he knew a genius mechanic. And one day in his Model T factory, the assembly line's going, he's cranking out cars, and the, the assembly line goes down, and he knew this genius mechanic, so he calls him. He calls the genius mechanic, and he says, you got to come help. The assembly line stopped. I'm in trouble. I'm losing money every, every moment. And so the guy shows up. And he tinkers on the belt for a moment. Throws a couple switches. And he leaves. And everything is up and running again. And he sent Henry Ford a bill for ten grand, $10,000. So Henry Ford sends him a letter. And he says, man, I, 
I, I appreciate what you did, but $10,000 seems a little exorbitant a price for the half an hour that you spent there. The man said, okay, I'll send you a new bill. You've heard versions of this, I'm sure, but this is the right one. I forget the guy's name, but this is true. He sent him a new bill, and the bill says this. The bill says, tinkering, $10. Knowing where to tinker, $9,990. God knows where you need for him to tinker, to say, get it right. God knows what to do in you to get you to be where you need to be. And I hope it doesn't take 15, 20 years like it did for Joseph, but it did. It took me a long time. You know, this month, I'm here seven years. This month, I'm here seven years. To me, this was a dream come true. I'm not sure I've ever put it that way, but it was. To me, preaching and teaching and just being a part of a church, part of doing this. This to me was a dream come true. I've been here seven years, but I'm 50. So for 43 of them, I didn't get to do this. And I always wondered, how long is it going to take? Doesn't mean I wasn't ministering. I was. I've been in ministry a long time, long, 30 years, maybe more. But this was a dream come true because it's where God had me. It's where God has me where he called me to seven years this the first of this month and and I was thinking about it the other day and thought to myself what did it take me a long time to get here get your crickets <laughs> God knows where to tinker where we need to be tinkered on I'm going to close with this listen we need to pass the pride test it's not, I went to this school, I went to that school, I, I did this and I did that. And who cares? Who cares? What am I doing for Jesus right now? Well, this morning, I got to witness the gym. The gas station attendant at Wawa's in Berlin. <laughs> And I used the opportunity because his name was my name. And he had a little name tag on. I said, Jim. I said, that's great. Same name. I'll remember you. Hey, God bless you, man. Oh, you too. Thanks. I'm on my way to church. Oh, are you? Say a prayer for me. I will. You can say a prayer for yourself too, you know. I can pray for you right now. Oh, that's okay. I got to run. And then he scampered off as fast as he could. But you know what? It was still an opportunity. Still an opportunity. He doesn't know who I am. He doesn't know where I came from. He doesn't even know I'm a pastor. I didn't tell him. Who cares? I didn't, I didn't need to tell him. I didn't tell him anything. So what? You understand where I'm coming from? There are a number of tests that Joseph is going to face that we're going to get into in the next couple weeks. I'm looking forward to next week, by the way. That's going to be a special day, family day. But the week in weeks to come, we're going to be talking about the different tests that Joseph has to go through that get him to where he needs to be. And that, I think, applies to every one of us. Now, it might not apply to you. That might not be your issue. But if you're here today and you realize, you know what? It's easy to sit back and go, we're doing pretty good. All I got to do is compare myself to that guy. I'm doing pretty good. All I got to do is compare myself to that family. We're doing all right. We're pretty spiritual compared to the guys down the street. That's not the way it works. It's not the way it works. No, the way it works is I need to compare myself to Jesus. And I'm always going to come up short. Amen. Can you stand with me? We're going to pray. Father, we know, we know that grace that grace and mercy was given at great cost through the sacrifice of Jesus. We know that. And today we pray that you would allow us not to take it for granted.
want to understand that everything we do that's of eternal value is based on your goodness and your mercy and your forgiveness and your kindness. And we ask God that we would never go beyond our means in terms of what we're saying. That we would never shine a light or prop ourselves up, but that we would always point a finger at the glory and the grace and the mercy of Christ and Him crucified. That is what we that is what we serve. That is who we honor. I pray, God, today that you would give us opportunity to witness, to be ministers to those around us, that we would be able to share our faith, not holding anything back. And God, if there's no pride in place, then there's no embarrassment in place. And God, if we have no ego to get in our way, then there's no pride, then there's no shame that will prevent us from sharing a moment of mercy with someone that doesn't know you. I pray that you'd make that true of us. This week, bring someone across our path that we can minister to. In Jesus' name, amen.